segment. <laughs> Start. Sorry, I didn't see you there. Yes, I will kick off. So my name is Vicky Hurd. I'm the head of farming at Sustain, the Alliance for Better Food and Farming, um, which is an alliance of about 100 organizations concerned with food and farming in some way or another. So Soil Association, Royal Society of Protection of Birds, um, the Royal um, Society of Nurses, all sorts are members of Sustain, because obviously food is central to our lives and should be produced in ways which nurture us and the planet. So we do a lot of campaigning, and I won't talk about that much at the beginning, but um, just to mention, I'm also the author of a book which I can sign today if you want to buy it, Rebugging the Planet, which is all the ways you can help get bugs back into your life um, and into the uh, environment which we need because they're critical. Um, so today we've got a, um, a cracking discussion about the future of nature-friendly farming. And obviously people think of nature as something out there, something to enjoy, but obviously nature is also absolutely critical for our um, very being, because of, uh, to uh, how we produce food, whether we can produce food, and whether we can actually live in, uh, in this, um, on this planet, this one home that we should be sharing with nature. Um, and so it's absolutely a critical discussion. It's critical that we increase the amount of farmers that are embracing nature-friendly farming practices, like the organic farmers and the wonderful food that you're eating today, organic and produced to principles, which um, we'll hear about today from our panelists. But um, there's a whole spectrum that farmers can go on to be nature friendly and help tackle um, greenhouse gas emissions. So there's a plethora of labels and there's a plethora of, of talk about regenerative farming, sustainable farming, organic farming. All these labels are starting to get out there and there's an awful lot of talk of paying farmers for sequestering carbon, drawing carbon down from the atmosphere to tackle climate change into the soil or in through um, plants and trees. So there's a load of things that are going to be out there in, in, for you to buy or for you to invest in, or they'd sound. So we're going to explore that. Oh, we've got our final panelist. Wonderful. <laughs> Welcome, Lindsay. <laughs> I'll just explain who we've got while she's getting mic'd up. Um, so we've got Jerry Alford from Soil Association, right. an advisor to farmers, and he'll explain what he does. Um, Richard Benwell, who was supposed to be with us from Wild of Country Link, unfortunately he's got a sick child, so can't make it. Um, but I can talk about what what he would have been talking about, because I work with him. Um, and Roger Kerr from Oxford, um, sorry, Oxford, Organic um, Farmers and Growers. Um, Richard Smith, who's the farm manager here at Dalesford, welcome. And Lindsay from the Organic Research Centre, welcome and thank you for making it. Uh, did you have trouble getting in? Because, yes, uh, that's good to know. It's obviously popular. It's obviously uh, going well. Thank you very much for my panellists. So, I'm going to ask them to give me three minutes, maybe four, because we've lost a panellist, so you can have three, uh, four, um, to explain what, um, what, what you do, where you're coming from, but also what you think is meant by sustainable farming, what your principles are for sustainable farming, so we get an idea of, of where you're all coming from. Um, and it's going to be hard, I know, in four minutes, but uh, what, what nature-friendly farming means to you? I'm going to start with you, Roger. That's all right. Yes. Yes, thank you. I, I knew I shouldn't have sat here. <laughs> uh, anyway, yes, someone mm -hmm. has to start. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for, for everybody for coming. Uh, my name's Roger Kerr, as, as Vicky said. I work for Organic Farms and Growers. We're a certifying I don't think you're as the Soil Association. Mm -hmm. Can everybody hear, just of checking? Sorry, am I not? Am I not you know, I need bike to... Mm -hmm. I need to flick my switch. Is that better? No. No? Try lifting the... Mm -hmm. thing. Is that right? Mm -hmm. No. Can anybody, can everybody hear me? No, it doesn't seem to be working. Oh. That's the right word. You're okay. I'm, I'm, work, I'm working now. <laughs> anyway, yeah. so yes. Yeah, so, oh, so, there we go, there we go. So yes, I work for Organic Farmers and Growers. We're an organic certifier. And we can talk about mm -hmm. organic regulation and the differences between organic and uh, regenerative and agroecological over the course of the discussion. But for the moment, uh, there are a number of bodies that certify organic farmers, and we're, we're one of them. Um, from my perspective, in terms of where am I coming from, one of our farmers, um, who was previously non-organic, used to spend considerable amounts of money on slug pellets. He was on a quite heavy farm, uh, and slugs were a real problem for him. Since going organic, he's found that actually slugs are no longer a problem. Uh, they've actually gone away. And 
The reason for that is because by not putting down slug pellets, he's not been poisoning the predators mm -hmm. that prey on slugs, and consequently, mm -hmm. those those predators are there, That's and therefore mm -hmm. they are consuming the mm -hmm. slugs rather than him killing them with metaldehyde, which is a rather nasty chemical. And what that really does for me is it really brings in the, the perspective of balance. And I think that's what mm. we're looking to, to deliver uh, in terms of our food production. And as Vicky said, mm. working within one planet uh, and with one ecosystem. And we've got to a point, I think, since the war, we came out of the Second World War, Europe was in tatters, the, the, the global south was in dire straits and poverty, and therefore, not surprising, the pressure was on in terms of producing food. And that's what farmers were asked to do, and that's what they did. Mm -hmm. And they did that with, without taking any thought or, on, or view on, on what the effect of that was on, on farming, on, on nature, sorry. And what we've then seen as over the, over the years is that has then started to impact on the environment and we've seen biodiversity decline and we've seen now the rise in terms of global warming and et cetera, et cetera. So, so there has been significant consequences from that. And I think we've also been through a period through the 70s and 80s where policymakers sort of thought really we should start taking some view on nature. We should be maybe thinking about nature a bit. But even so, they sort of felt that actually there would be a technological way of dealing with this, that we don't need to actually look to, to nurture nature, we just need to find an alternative approach. And I think what we've seen, that, however, as time's gone on, that that simply isn't the case, that we do actually have to start to think about how we're farming and, and, and how our food is produ produced in a way that brings balance. So that's my Great. Starting. Thank you very much. I'd love a, a solution to my snails. <laughs> I, I'm not using we can pellets. Talk about that. Yeah, yeah. I think one of them is actually having um, plants that are resistant. They don't things yeah. they don't like is one of the ways of dealing with it. Indeed. But getting the predators is absolutely key as part of the organic system. Richard, if, will you ex sort of introduce yourself what you do here, which I is will. a fantastic Hello. place. So is my microphone working? Hmm. Yep. So good morning everybody. My name is Richard Smith and I head up agriculture for Dalesford. We farm 4,000 acres in the Cotswolds and a further 3,500 acres in Staffordshire. So it's a considerable piece of farming that we do. I knew from a very early age, so a lot of young people get to a certain stage in their life and don't really know what they want to do, but mm. I knew from a very early age that I was going to be a farmer. I grew up on a mixed farm in Northamptonshire, and it was a truly mixed farm. Uh, and, what I, and then I went on to uh, work on, in the Scottish borders in the Chiviot Hills in Northumberland on a hill farm where to me that's sustainable regenerative agriculture without any label of organic and so on. And there are vast areas in the country that are farmed in that way. I then went to the other end of the country and become a sort of a, a manager of livestock on a farm in Cornwall and that was four applications of nitrogen, four silage cuts, mass production, all the chemicals make it happen from a very small acreage to make it pay basically and we poured nitrogen on. Did that for a wee while and then in 1992 I emigrated to New Zealand. And I wanted to go to New Zealand because I wanted to work with livestock and understand different types of systems because what I am, above anything, is a stockman. So I have a real appreciation of lovely livestock, properly reared livestock. And New Zealand taught me, without really knowing it, that they had this amazing system where they bred animals to produce from the green stuff under their feet, not the protein fed to them out of a bag. What I want to point out now, before we start, any questions is, is that I'm not about running down any style of agriculture. I'm not the guy that looks across the fence and says the other boys are evil because they're intensive in their approach to agriculture. The fact is, is that if agriculture hadn't gone through this real intensification a few decades ago, you know, people were just going to fall by the way, sir. They, they can't keep their heads above water. So if somebody says to you, if you use these chemicals and you apply this nitrogen and you follow all this science of intensive production and you will make money and keep your head above water, I think that's what drove that intensification and made people you know, really enhance and embrace real intensive agriculture. The trouble is, is that we've now gotten to a point where that has degraded soils, degraded wildlife, the environment, all of those things, and we've done it without realising it. 
I've been a passionate organic farmer now for a very long time. Before coming to Dalesford, which is 16 years ago, I can hardly believe that. Um, I managed the university farms at Oxford and I took them through an organic conversion. And what I can tell you is, is that if you breed the right animal that's fit for the environment in which you're farming, you will be successful in your approach to production of food. I'm a huge believer it, that mono systems in agriculture don't work, and that's mm. of course a byproduct of intensification. So farmers have got really good at producing cereals or really good at producing milk, and they've intensified mm. that whole thing. Whereas I'm a huge believer in diversity mm. on your in your farm, so that one enterprise is then feeding another enterprise, and you have this sort of rotation of energy going around your farm. And I have many examples on this farm of how that works and why it works. Thank you, Richard. That's great. Yeah, the diversity and the interactions, particularly with livestock, absolutely key there. Jerry. Okay, so I'm Jerry Alford. I am one of the farming advisors in the farming and land use team, and that's only because we've just changed names recently, so labelling and stuff, mm -hmm. in the Soil Association. So I, unlike Ro Rogers, works for OFNG, who are a certifier, Soil Association certification do the certifying. I work for the charity and we have much more of an advisory and a support role to people who looking at organic practices, looking at converting. My background, which is more relevant to the conversation really, I am a retired dairy farmer from Devon, basically. Um, family farm of about up to 500 acres at one point um, in the rolling hills of Devon, which um, based around a Holstein herd, based around producing maximum amount of food possible off the farm. So we would grow food off the farm. We bought a certain amount of imported products, but basically we were really trying to maximize production from our own fields. As a result, we weren't giving money to other people. And I think that's a trend that's come out in farming in the last 15, 20 years, how much farmers are giving to other people and they're not keeping it on the farm anymore because the profit's in some other part of the supply chain. As a mixed farmer in Devon, we grew maize, we grew cereals, we grew beans, and we grew lots of grass and the muck from the cows went back into the rotation. Foot and mouth came along, really mucked up the whole family business and made the decision to sell the cows. So we then moved into a beef and sheep system and then we went organic for lots of reasons. But one of the major ones is that was the direction I felt we were going anyway. It was such a logical thing to do. Why buy in fertilizer when you can actually get it from the back end of a cow? or you can plow in a clover field and that grows the, the wheat crop for the next year. So it just became a logical next step to move on. And now within the role that I have within the Soil Association, we're really supporting those sort of farming practices. The phrase regenerative comes up. It's a really big bit of greenwashing being used by an awful lot of international companies now to justify their systems. Mm -hmm. Regenerative does mean a system which is supported the soil. Soil is the most important thing. Soil Association's logo is Soil health, Climate Health, and that the whole three are interrelated. We have healthy soil, we get healthy people. We have healthy people, we have a healthy climate. The whole thing just cycles round and round. And so what we're looking here, nature-friendly farming, if we have systems which support animals, wildlife, and that includes the bugs and the stuff in the ground, there's a huge number of insects and bugs and bacteria and fungi that live in the ground underneath us and have important role. And if we start changing what we're giving them, we change what's in the ground. And we change the way the plants grow, we change the interactions with animals. Where does ill health come in animals? Where does it come in plants? Where does it come in people? A lot of it comes from what we're being given to eat, which maybe isn't healthy. So that's broadly where we're coming from this one. Thank you, Jerry. And last but definitely not least, Lindsay, you're from Organic Research Centre. Maybe you explain what that is and what, what you see as agroecological and organic and regenerative differences. Yeah, mm. so, uh, yeah, as it's uh, as just been said, I work at the Organic Research Centre as a livestock researcher. Uh, we're a small group of researchers, but we try to uh, look at everything. I mean, organic is a holistic system, so we are looking at marketing, we're looking at life cycle analysis, biodiversity, crop benefits, and last but not least, of course, livestock for me. So I um, second everything that's been said about the importance of livestock in organic systems, but um, my background as a professional scientist as a, is as an applied ethologist. So the behavior of the livestock is 
really important to me and of course also to organic um, principles. It's more important for me, uh, if we have to consider livestock in two dimensions, if you like, not only as a, a, a unit of production that we are looking to get food from, but they are also an integral part of the biodiverse, the ecological system in their own right. And we have to try to learn to manage them in that way and respect that role over and above um, how we manage them and harvest them as livestock. Uh, I'm thinking of certain examples of grazing patterns. So as a, a cow grazes throughout a season, they'll create different levels of grass heights. And each of these levels have different insects that are pertinent to those, each of those levels. And of course, as you've got livestock grazing, you, you're bringing in the dunging and, you, and that brings in an environment for dung beetles and other insects to thrive on that dung. At the same time, we have to consider the wider context, which is also thinking of farming vertically. So uh, Jerry's mentioned the soil, but let's think also higher than grass and crop level. Let's think about the trees and the, and the hedgerows, um, bringing in environments that promote further biodiversity, predators that come in that are critical to manage systems without chemicals. So this is really the driver for me for engaging with uh, organic and in the wider concept, more sustainable, more resilient farming systems. Thank you very much, that's great. So you've got a, um, a spectrum um, from people looking at organic systems and people look, wanting to use organic te um, processes. Um, Richard Benwell, who runs Wild Africa Countryside Link, may have talked a bit about the, the wider nature context that he works in. He's been working a lot on the Environment Bill, which is a major piece of legislation which is going through um, government at the moment, and why they want the government to have a target for 30% of nature protected by 2030 in law and enforced and regulated. And he's absolutely clear, and I spoke to him earlier, his child is ill, as I said, he w I wasn't able to make it. But one of the key things he'd be saying is that we need to be supporting farming systems with an adequate budget, and there are gaps in the budget ahead, really dangerous situation where farmers are facing so many challenges. But we need an adequate budget for farmers to go on that transition, which Jerry and, and Roger can sort of inf um, help them go on through advice, through support, through demonstration farms. And I'm sure this farm, is this farm a demonstration farm as well? Do you get farmers to come around? Oh, I would have thousands of visitors Good. to Dales. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. Yeah, so that demonstration when farmers are talking to other farmers about the kind of techniques we just heard about, absolutely critical, but it needs funds. Um, not forever, maybe, but just we need that transition really well supported. So I know Richard would say that because obviously 70% of the land in the UK is farmed. So it's a critical part of nature recovery. And we have one of the lowest levels of nature um, diversity and abundance in Europe, in the UK. It's hard to believe being here. You know, we're surrounded by bugs. Just you walk through and it's amazing bird song, et cetera. But in the UK in general, all the studies are clear. We're really low on nature. So it's critical that farm systems do support nature. Um, one of the things I'm going to ask them to say now is whether you think, I understand what you're saying, Rog, um, Richard, not dissing other farms. But what would you say some of the most um, problematic things that have come out of the farming system up till now are? Uh, you know, if you, if you wanted to name a particular thing that you would thought were most dangerous that we really need to turn away from. Um, I won't start with you, Roger. It's not fair to start <laughs> that. Was, Lindsay, could you, could you uh, say something you think particularly dangerous that we've been doing? Yeah, I think, um, well, there are lots of issues across mm. the board. Yeah. But perhaps this... In, lack of diversity in, mm. in rotations. Yeah. So using the landscape for mm. one particular product, mm. um, plant or, or animal over a longer period of time, creating mm. a real imbalance in the ecology mm. um, and yeah. at its worst, poisoning the landscape. Mm. Brilliant, yeah, so it doesn't work really. You have to pile loads of chemicals in to make it work mm. and loads of, um, uh, and it can stress animals being in all, in, all in one place, and too many of them in one place or, you know, 100% housed, for instance. So, yeah, so good one. Diversity, absolutely key. Jerry, would you want to say what <laughs> problems you might have seen <laughs> in your <laughs> travels to farms? How to do it without dissing other farming systems is not impossible. That's yeah. the problem because yeah. um, 
inherently by promoting one system, you are criticizing another. It's mm. a natural thing to do. And this is not meant as an attack. But mm. you mentioned the chemicals and the fertilizers. Mm. And it's not just, it's the effect on the soil. It's the effect on the bugs. It's the residues left. It's the, the cocktail effect, as we describe it, of mixing different mm. chemicals together that haven't actually been tested together to prove mm. how yeah. safe they are. And then you get the residues of intensification mm. of livestock and also um, the, the fertilizers that get used, the fact that they're over applied to chase a mythical mm. po potential yield, not a real yield, mm. um, which leads to issues in the rivers, you know, mm. eutrophication. And yeah. there's a massive great lake apparently in, in the Atlantic Ocean yeah. of where it's just, it's just the phosphates that's washed out of the soil mm. in, from the farming systems. Mm. That's a negative because mm. it's creating issues for other mm. downstream. So we ourselves mm. might be running a very, in our mm. mind, very good farming system, but inadvertently we're causing problems for the downstream. Mm. Thank you. Richard, can you say anything or are you rather not? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah. I'm, when I say I'm not going to diss them, I can huh? point out where I think they're yes, not going yeah. in right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely fair, I That's think. That's exactly yeah. what I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So obviously agrochemicals, insecticides, mm. nitrogen, phosphates, water, rivers, all mm. of these things, invertebrates in small numbers, not there because of intensive agriculture. But for me, the main one is animal welfare. Mm. So you, the consumer, you know, I'd be the first person to say eat less meat and think about what you're buying. You know, buy a chicken once a fortnight rather than once mm. a week. Don't increase your budget, but buy one with mm. that credential behind mm. it that is environmentally friendly. Huge thing about animal welfare. So just very quickly, you know, if I can get questioned a lot about animal welfare and how milking cows isn't right and all these types of things, beef cows. Do you know there are beef cows that are walking around in this country and much of Europe that that are artificially inseminated. They're fed drugs to synchronize um, uh, their reproductive cycle with their female friends in the group. They're artificially inseminated. Mm. And then they have to be cesarean section for them to give birth to their calves because their, 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 their birth canal, their pelvis, simply isn't allowed to open enough because of the muscle mass that's been bred around them by selective breeding. Belgian blue, look it up in, um, on Google, mm. Google it. Mm. So animal welfare is a huge thing for me. Intensive dairy farming, yeah? And it's a really good example because in about... In 1968, a group of Americans came over to, uh, to Holland and they took back to America a group of Holstein cattle, Holstein dairy cows, indigenous of Holland, and they instantly put, back then in imperial terms, um, 100 gallons on, it, on the yield of milk they took from a cow in a lactation. A huge percentage of the milk produced in the world today comes from a cold cow, that cow called a Holstein. She's a skeleton, a, 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 a hat rack with a skin stretched over her. She can produce 10, 12,000 litres of milk in a lactation. And the lactation is measured on 305 days. In order to give that 10 or 12,000 litres of milk, she's been fed on average four tonnes of high energy compound feed imported onto a farm. That's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. yeah? So they're the sorts of things that interest me. So how are you going to get around that? What are you going to breed a cow that doesn't require that energy, that high octane fuel? You're going to get away from that Formula One racing cow and you're going to build something that's four wheel driving and get across a dirt track. So for the last uh, 15, 16 years at Dalesford, we've bred back to what I consider to be a really sustainable cow. We went back to the pure British Frisian, also originally indigenous of Holland, but they've been bred pure in Britain for many, many years. So we have a medium-sized cow, and what I should also point out is, is these Holstein cows, they do or do not enjoy 2.6 lactation. So they give birth at five, sorry, they give birth at the age of two, and they're dead before they're five, but they've supplied their 30,000 litres of milk in their machine-type factory farming. Mm. So we bred back to these Frisians. Our cows produce 6,000 litres of milk. They eat one tonne of concentrate. 0.8 of that tonne is produced on this farm and they last for seven lactations. And that's mm. just been done by slowing that breeding programme down. Rather than improving it for volume, improving it for quality of milk, um, you know, and longevity of life. The the fact that they give birth to male calves, so when the beef price is low in the, in the intensive system, you know, if a Holstein gives birth to a pure Holstein bull calf, a male, he's rendered pretty useless to anybody. 
Mm. Yeah. And they shoot them at birth because, you know, that's if the ball, but it's not too bad at the moment because beef prices are good. But if it goes down, they'll just do away with those calves. 100% of the calves we produce obviously go through full fruition, beef enterprise and so on. And they play a major part in the beef production for Dalesford. I could think of a thousand things that, that intensive farming mm, yeah. brings that's fine for that. That's a pretty good one. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty, I mean, animal welfare, critical. Did you want to come in on that? Yeah, I would just like to add to that. Of course, I agree mm. with all of that, except just to say that there is no ban on using any animals in organic systems. Mm. It's just that uh, the more native breeds are more appropriate yeah, for those systems. They fit the system. They mm. do. Uh, mm. But I would just like to say that I interviewed a farmer in mm. New York State who'd gone from high intensive, mm. uh, high yield mm. herd and switched to organic. And the biggest difference was for him was getting the cows out onto grass. And he told me that uh, the most impactful mm. learning yeah. experience that he mm. had was that he reduced his milk yield mm. by 50%, mm. but he reduced his mm. disease incidence by 90%. Wow. Yeah, so it's a huge, it's a huge massive, cost reduction as well. A massive welfare impact, yeah. even though these were still mm. Holstein yeah. animals. You know, it can still make a huge difference. And he to had a welfare. market. He found a market that would yes. support him in doing that. That's yes. something we should go on to in a bit. But I just want yes. to ask, Roger, what would you say was the worst? Um, if you, could, okay. you don't have to, but you can think of one thing. <laughs> well, the only thing I would say is um, mm. one thing. I think, uh, mm. and going back to Richard's point about intensification, I think the whole ethos of farming over the last mm. 60, 70 years has been about dominating nature. Mm. So nature's been subjugated, dominated, uh, mm. suppressed, mm. And, that, and that has been very much the whole policy framework mm. and, and, you know, without mm. dissing farms, at the end of the day, they have to operate mm. within, within what mm. they're being asked to operate within. Mm. Uh, but the policy environment has been around dominating nature. Uh, and if you read mm. the Farmers Weekly or any of the farming mm. magazines, less so now, but historically, mm. All these chemicals were called gauntlet or commando mm, yeah. or some yeah. sort of military... Bullets or something, yeah. yeah. <laughs> something of a yeah. military context, yeah. it, which, which sort of gave the essence of this battle that, mm. that farmers seemed to feel that they were in uh, battling against nature, that, that, that there was a war going on. Mm. And actually, it, that's not how mm. it should be. And we can't mm. fight can't. the ecosystem mm. that we work within. Mm. We can't fight the planet. We mm. have to work with it. Mm. And I think that fundamentally, for me, mm. uh, has mm. made a huge difference mm. uh, in the way that we've approached farming, in the way mm. we've approached food production. And the other thing I just wanted to touch on, I think, mm. is also around the drive for cheap food. And we've talked about mm. the costs of food, and I, I appreciate it has mm. to be affordable, but at the same time, we're in a situation where the UK is the third uh, cheapest country in the world behind Singapore and the USA for, for the price of food. and and. And obviously, if farmers, and Richard's talked about this need, this, this, this economic need, if farmers are driven to produce food at very, very cheap levels, then they will ultimately move mm. down the route of trying to, to, to control mm. the environment and, mm. and to manage their risk. Mm. So, so I think there is a discussion, mm. I think Mickey will probably pick up on that, but there is a discussion mm. around, around the price of food. And, mm. and that then leads on to other issues around mm. socioeconomic and how can people afford it. And, you mm. know, there's a, there's a, it opens up a whole. Right. Mm. Great. Can I just ask people if you're willing to put your hand up? Um, what you feel? Do you feel you know what organic means when you buy? If you're buying organic, you're coming here. You've seen Dalesford. Do you, do you feel you know what organic means? Does anybody want to put their hand up? Do you, do you want to say? Hmm. Mm. Avoiding chemicals. I'm going to repeat what you say. So we're going to avoiding chemicals and mm. diversity. Yeah. Whole food, not whole foods, right? Okay. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Right. Because the question is, um, avoiding um, fertilizers makes it less or more expensive, or leave it, leaving it to fallow and uh, allowing it to um, get. Uh, regenerate, so to speak, um, through natural systems. Is that cheaper or more expensive? Does anybody want to answer that? Hmm? So it makes it less expensive, expensive by not using the chemicals. So mm. an intensive farmer growing four or five tonnes mm. of wheat to the acre would be spending £100 an acre on chemicals mm. and £100 an acre on fertiliser. 
we wouldn't have that in an organic system. I've toured many, many thousands of farmers around this farm over the years, and the big point they always make to me is, is well, Richard, yes, you've shown us these beautiful fertility building crops, these legumous crops that are fixing atmospheric nitrogen into the soil, but it's out of use for three years whilst you're building that fertility to grow a crop. With diverse farming, like we have here at Dalesford, I'm growing, I'm using all of those fertility building crops all of the time. So I'm ensiling them and using them for winter forage, silage, red clover. I'm fattening thousands of lambs on clover lays whilst it's in that fertility building stage. And I'm able to utilize those fertility building crops all the time in all different sorts of way. And then you get this real interest, this these guys will say, well, don't all the lambs get bloat, you know, because la lambs will blow on, on clover lays and so on. And no, they don't. If you put in sort of old fashioned stockmanship skills and introduce them and put certain bits of grass in with the clover lays so that they take them up, build the bacteria up within their gut. They're sort of, what we're doing is, um, we, if we could bring back our grandfathers and say, how did you do that? It would be a great thing, because what we're looking at doing is slowing it back down to those types of systems. To answer the question bluntly, no, it's cheaper. It's cheaper inputs to produce the end product. Yeah. But there is, okay. but there is, sorry, think, just, yeah, there is, okay. a, but there so is a quick, yield. Quickly, because we want yeah, to go Sorry, on, yeah. there is a yield, mm. there is a yield penalty. Yeah. yeah. So when, so when mm. you look at the cost of organic mm. food compared with non-organic food, whilst the, mm. the, uh, the variable cost, as Richard indicated, the sprays and fertilizers are less, invariably, usually the, the, the fixed costs, labor and so, so forth are, are higher. Sometimes you have to hand row crops and that type of thing. And, and often you have to run through the field more frequently to, to, mm. to harrow the weeds yeah, out. I'm talking about cereal. Sorry. sorry. Mm. So, so, so there is a, so there mm. is a, there is a cost uh, there. I mean, I think in the evening dairy, but as we've talked about, you know, we're against the cow producing tail, twelve thousand liters worse than producing six thousand liters. You still got to feed the cow. You still got to house it. You still got to have somebody to look after it. So, so whilst the costs of production are less, at the end of the day, the yields are less, and therefore, yeah, to get mm. the returns, mm. yeah. I was I was going to go on to the National Food Strategy because I think it's, it's relevant to what you're, you're exploring because it's linked. Is that all right, Lindsay? We just, you, did you want to... Sorry. You, you really want to say a piece, I'm sorry. No, actually, Roger's mm. really just okay. said what I wanted mm. to say, but I would mm. also add, you know, there is that element if you're mm. taking degraded mm. soils as well, you also have to recognise there's mm. a gap between mm. reaching optimum yes. fertility, so mm. your yields will also yeah. suffer in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. Thank no, you. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's worth saying there is a um, really good study that was done by a independent, seriously top research um, study looking at the whole of Europe and they actually identified that you could actually feed the whole of Europe with organic principles, ag ag agroecological <laughs> principles which are applied across Europe, but it would require people to change their diet, it would require, and, and that's fine, it's nothing, it's not going to harm you, and it would require people to waste less food. Um, and those two things are critical to this whole picture. Mm -hmm. um, and I mention that because I think I would like to ask the panel what they thought of the National Food Strategy. So the National Food Strategy came out a few weeks ago and it was two years in the making by a guy called Henry um, Dimbleby who was tasked by Michael Gove originally, who was head of the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, to look at the f whole food system and what needed to happen with the view that the government would then implement, maybe, some of the things that came out of this strategy. So it's looking not just at the farming side of it, but all the food side of it, because there is, beyond the farm gate, are so many things that don't work for the kind of good systems that we're talking about. I work a lot on those. I work on supply chain fairness, on um, changing supply chains so that they actually are farmer focused and support and understand what farmers need to do, the kind of changes that organic farmers need to implement and uh, agroecological farmers need to implement. But the National Food Strategy came out a few weeks ago and talked about a lot of these things. Um, I was very disappointed it didn't talk enough about supply chain. I, don't know, I will say first, that's my disappointment. <coughs> but it did mention agroecological farming. It talked about having a really strong move towards more sustainable farming systems and making sure that people can afford to eat well, eat healthy and eat from systems that are sustainable. And he talked about junk food a lot. Like, um, he had, has a thing about um, Percy Pigs, which I know are very popular with, with um, uh, product, but, you know, high sugar fat, um, uh, salty products, which are a very big part of our diet now. He's got a big focus on that. And I think that's got an agroecological bent to it, because highly junk food 
food that um, is, is very junk food, high f uh, fat, sugar and salt, comes mostly from very intensive monoculture systems. It's a lot of sugar, it's a lot of cereals, uh, it's a lot of um, um, oils and fillers. And then you make it look great by adding additives and colors and uh, um, flavorings. And that's very much dominated our food system, and that's what we need to turn away from in order to allow farmers, I would say, to be agroecological. So anyway, I think that, for me, the National Food Strategy did talk about that a lot and was really great, and particularly for children's health. So I'd like to ask the panel if, they, if they've got any thoughts about the rest of the food strategy, whether you thought it did a good job, whether we need to press for more. <laughs> Roger. Well, okay. <laughs> okay. okay. National Food Strategy, um, I think it's a great initiative. I think uh, really welcome that the government are thinking about these things. And some of the, some of the points that Mickey raised, I think, are really, really critical around, around getting rid of junk food. And they're talking about a, uh, a fat tax. I fat think tax. Sugar tax. Fat, sugar yeah, tax sugar as well. Sugar tax. Yeah, they so have so, so there's there, mm. some things that mm. I don't think this government mm. will particularly no. embrace. But, but there's some good ideas and there's a lot mm. discussed in there. From my perspective, in terms of regenerative, agroecological, organic farming, whatever you want to call it. Mm. Um, there's a lot of talk about agroecology, but there's no real understanding as to what that actually means. And I think mm. the danger, we've, we've, yeah. uh, we haven't really touched on this, but agroecological farming, there's a definition of what it means, which I can read out to you, but I won't bother. But, but it sort of talks about some principles, but there's nothing, there's nothing actually that sets out what it is or what it isn't. And therefore, a farm, any farmer, within reason can call himself agroecological and can undertake any mm. number of practices that Richard's already alluded to and Jerry's talked about as well and still seem to be called agroecological. So from our point of view, from an organic standpoint, there is a set of regulations, there's a clear definition as to what organic is and isn't and what an organic farmer can and can't do and Richard has to abide by those rules day in day out, as does Jerry, day in day out. Uh, and that gives you as a consumer a clear understanding as to what, that, that if you're buying something that says it's organic, it has fulfilled a certain set of practices, like the, the no use of fertilizers, no use of pesticides, et cetera, et cetera. Agroecological is much, much, much grayer. It's, it's a sort of bit of a fuzzy phrase, really. And at the moment, there is a danger that those people that want to carry on doing what they're currently doing mm. will sort of start to hijack this term because as there is no guidelines as to what it is and it isn't, you can do just about whatever you want. And from an organic standpoint within the National Food Strategy, they have done a bit of a job in terms of organic in that they have came out, they compared the cheapest possible product that you could buy in Sainsbury's yes. with an organic product and mm. said, organic's way too expensive. Mm. And, it, and, um, and forgetting that there's a whole raft of products out there that people can buy. Mm. So if you look at the milk fixture, for instance, there is the standard whole milk, but then there's Cravendale and there's organic and there's nighttime milk and there's all sorts mm. of different types of milks. And people are buying all of these to greater and lesser extent. So you have to look at the whole food system and the whole pricing within retailers in that context. And you can't simply just say oh, organic's more expensive than the cheapest possible product. Because that also avoids the fact that actually people are buying things for lots of other reasons than just price. They're buying for convenience, they're buying because of family preferences. You know, Kellogg's cornflakes are more expensive than own label organic cornflakes. People are buying Kellogg's cornflakes. Nobody questions whether people should be buying Kellogg's cornflakes or not, but they are expensive because they're Kellogg's. And everybody knows that a Kellogg's cornflake is really nice. So, so I'm just saying, I think from our point of view, I think the national food strategy has not painted what I feel is a fair reflection on organic. And I think it talks about agroecology. And let's be honest with you, organic is the only regulated uh, um, legally recognised, internationally recognised agroecological standard. And therefore, I think the National Food Strategy should have embraced organic much more. And have hopefully. organic standards, they've been developed for f sort of 50 years, haven't they? Or is it 60? Well, I think the, the Soil mm. Association would develop, develop mm. the first standard, which mm. was an, uh, which was mm. a, a, sorry, after Jerry should answer this, mm. but... Uh, no, no, you're the historian. <laughs> was a, was a, was a, was a, uh, uh, um, 
um, you know, opened the, mm. you know, it, it wasn't the legally it's legal mm. standard, but that was that was developed in the 70s. Mm. There was then a development as organic mm. started to become more, um, people became more interested. Mm. There was a recognition that there needed to be some guidance mm. here. It was a little bit like the Wild West, and this is the mm. danger I think with That's the ice. I was going to use the phrase you know, Wild West yeah, now. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, you know, yeah. people could call, and mm. even now, I mean, I took mm. the dog out the other night and walked down the street mm. in the village, and someone would put duck eggs organic underneath, and I'm thinking, is it yeah, really no, no, organic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway. Anyway, that's, mm. that's beside the point. Mm. So I think, there, so there was a need for that. Mm. So at the end of the mm. 80s, uh, the European mm. Union took a decision to set mm. out a set of legal standards. Mm. And so the first set of organic standards, mm. legally defined mm. organic standards, was in 1991. Mm. And that was for crops initially, and then the livestock mm. standards were developed again. Mm. And then about 10 years, 12 years mm. later, another standard was then developed. And joy of joys for all of us, they're, they're now looking to develop another one which will be coming out next yeah. year. Well, I, I mean, trying the reason, to improve things. Yeah, the reason I asked you is because it's not just sort of come out of nowhere, it's come out of a lot oh, yeah. of probably mistakes and a lot of you know, wrong directions, but a l huge amount of learning mm. from a group of farmers and researchers that have developed the organic standard. And now it's a legal standard, but it, it's it, you know, comparing it is yeah. it's slightly just unfair. You know, it's really. Sorry, my sorry, last phrase, because okay. I know everyone else wants to talk about <laughs> our chairman. Uh, the chairman of our mm. farm, his father started farming organically in 1947. <coughs> right. So, Lots of so, uh, so there were and there were two mm. or three farms uh, in mm. in the UK at that time. After the war came in, and mm. they started uh, government mm. started to push the use of nitro mm. chalk and certain mm. certain chemicals. And there are a certain number of farmers who immediately said, "No, this is not the way we want to farm. This is not how we should be farming." And therefore, they became. Now, whether they called it organic in 1947, I'm not so sure. Mm. Lady Eve Balfour, who was the founder mm. of the Soil Association, was mm. a huge uh, proponent of organic, mm. and that pre-war. Yeah. Uh, so it has so it's been a long coming time coming. For, coming. There's a lot yeah. of learning. That's the kind of thing yeah. I wasn't, you know, Sorry. it's, it's oh. going to come out, come out of a lot of learning, a lot of mistakes, and a lot of understanding that's grown through those yeah. systems. Um, Lindsay, you want to say something about the National Sorry. Food Strategy? So, uh, well, slightly. actually, I'd quite like to build on what Roger okay. was saying. Really. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mm. mean, I. Of course, organic is the one mm. that has the standard. So if you buy organic, mm. you can be sure that's what you're getting. Yeah. But you know, let's not criticise mm. overly the other mm. approaches and let's applaud them for mm. moving towards more sustainable yeah. uh, farming. But uh, in terms of agroecology, I mean, that's gone through a very convoluted process. And yeah. originally, the, the original meaning mm. of agroecology uh, agroecology was the science so it's mm. looking at agronomy with mm. ecology as part of it so mm. and that still remains true that's that's an mm. area of, of scientific research today yeah. predominantly from uh, the US but still very much the case yeah, in okay. Germany and France mm. uh, it's also a movement mm. and it's also practice yes. so it's really quite complicated mm. but they are Mm. setting themselves mm. some definitions. Mm. They're not the same as the organic principles, mm. which um, if mm. some aren't familiar with those, that's health, mm. ecology, fairness and care mm. that overarches everything mm. that is happening in organic. Mm. Um, but they do look at things such as productivity, sustainability and equity. Mm. So they look at the supply chain as well, having a, a role in, in the marketing. Increasingly so. Yeah. So, so even within mm. the um, mm. practice, if you like, and part of mm. the research, they've transitioned from mm. field mm. level to farm level mm. to system level, and they're increasingly mm. looking at mm. uh, the whole, whole, food, the whole system. food system. Yeah. Yes, Which is critical, I yes. think, you know, and get, taking us back to the National Food Strategy and whether people can afford and access... Um, the kind of foods that are from an organic uh, or yeah. an agroecological system is, yeah. is key. Yeah. But of course, mm. let's not forget mm. that much of this mm. learning is based on the organic systems yes, because exactly. this is yeah, yeah. where is the Is anybody confused yet? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Too many words. I so mean, imagine, you're, you're imagine yeah. you're a farmer mm. or you're a farming mm. family and <laughs> you've, you've been encouraged to farm in a certain way for the last few decades and that's usually been intensively and then you've been paid this standard subsidy which we call the BPS, or the Single Farm Payment. So a farmer's paid an amount of money for every hectare of land that he farms that is in, kept in good agricultural condition. That's being phased out, so that's the big news, and that's what's making a lot of farmers very nervous. So in the next few years, there will be no Single Farm Payment, this lump of money that comes into their farm. 
The government are going to subsidise agriculture, but they're going to do it in a different way, where farmers are paid to be more agroecologically friendly, mm. supporting the environment, etc., mm. which sounds fantastic. But there are an awful lot of nervous people about now, about mm. just about how they're going to make that happen mm. within their farming systems. Now, it's a great thing, and it's really pushing change, and the interest from people wanting to understand about organic agriculture or more environmentally friendly practices mm. has never been greater. Mm. And it needs to be really, for me, it needs to be really simple messages mm. that governments mm. and so on put out about what our targets mm. are and where we need to be. Mm. Um, a lot of people, you know, the average age of a farmer in this country is mm. about 63 or 4 years old. Yeah. You know, how do you encourage it? It needs young people. Agriculture mm. needs to be seen as one of the uh, better career paths rather than yeah, one of the absolutely. lower ones yeah. and we need to push that forward but mm -hmm. it becomes so complicated yeah. but uh, uh, mm. you know national food strategies and all these types of things yes very good but keep it super simple and give yeah. us re very clear messages and, yeah give a question there that yes I'll, I'll, I'll ask that's a question i just wanted to, jerry did you want to say anything about the national food strategy <laughs> it's just a complicated thing i think mm. one point i would like to make is you, it's the ultra mm. processed food that they're talking about all the time mm. we've got to go back to more simple straightforward food mm. If, you, if you're a soya bean grower mm. in South America, yeah. you're told Europe wants my byproduct, mm. which is the protein meal. Mm. If you're, or you're told that the industrial food processors want the byproduct oil because the guys mm. in Europe want the protein meal. Mm. And they're both being sold as byproducts. Yes. We don't need to buy European, um, South American mm. soya bean meal to bring into the UK. We can grow beans in the UK. Mm. We can actually grow beans on a large amount of the UK arable land. Mm. We can get rid of this commodity production. We can end up producing food for our own animals. Why don't we do it? Because the supply chain is owned by the big shippers, mm. the big companies, the big mm. feed mills, the big supply chain. They've taken a, over the whole thing. Mm. So that's mm. one area. Yeah. You mentioned the other supply chain. Mm. Big news at the moment, lorry drivers. Yes, of We're course. shortage of yeah. lorry drivers. Yeah. The supermarkets have mm. been paying... Mm. 2,000 pound golden hellos to lorry drivers to go and drive mm. for them. Mm. And who are they taking the lorry drivers from? The people who used to supply their warehouses mm. with the products. So they've now got lorry drivers working for Tesco's who are sitting around waiting because there's no there's food no in the product. warehouse yeah, yeah. to take to the shop. It's a, very, it's a pretty broken system, it's a pretty I think. Broken system. It's a broken system, very centralised system. Yeah. And yeah. that issue is good that you brought up the soya. And I was just reading this morning a, a wonderfully effusive article by Cargill which is the world's leading grain trader. Huge private company, hugely powerful, and it's got a whole regenerative farming approach, and it's telling all its farmers to be regenerative and giving them tools to do it. And I'm very skeptical, because one of the business model that they use is very much about monocultures, it's about the lowest price, lowest cost raw materials to send anywhere around the world uh, to, to put into a lot of processed food. Anyway, I'll leave it there, we had a question. If, I'll have to repeat it so people can hear, so do it slow. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It's a large percentage of supermarkets sell our food, yeah. Yes. Mm. Yeah. How do you... Mm. Yes. On board. Yeah. Um, what do we do with supermarkets? Yeah. Well, I mean, how do, yeah. How in, how yeah. So how supportive are, are the supermarkets? I would just say, I mean, I work for about 20 years to try and get regulations and statutory codes so the supermarkets stop abusing suppliers. So there is a statutory code of practice for the top 12, yeah. 13 supermarkets, but not the rest of the supply chain, and it's not good enough. So I'm actually investing now in a lot of my work in alternative better food traders and different to develop an alternative for a lot of farmers. But as you say, supermarkets are probably here to stay. Amazon has its own high street stall now near where I live. It was empty, I have to say, when I went past it yesterday, but it would look very gloomy. But uh, what do you think? Do you think supermarkets are, are changing, do you think they're doing anything better to help farmers? Anybody want to answer that? 18 months ago, oh, they turned Jerry. around to, to they mm. rang Helen Browning, our CEO, and say we need more organic product because all the um, Farm everyone's closed down, lockdown and everything. Oh, like. Everyone's so going to, to farm shops. Mm. We've got gaps in our shelves and we're being outsold mm. by the farm shops and the mm. box schemes. 
mm. we want organic products. And she effectively turned around and said, not a chance, because you've been, you really haven't been supporting of us. So that's great. And you the can people instantly supporting. produce mm. organic food mm. on day one because mm. someone's asked for it yesterday. They've got mm. to understand the supply chain, the yeah, circle. Absolutely. They are so desperate to be, have a product is available for anyone who comes in. If they've decided mm. they want to buy let's say, I don't know, mm. French beans for Christmas or strawberries for Christmas. Mm. They're not grown mm. in the UK. We don't need strawberries. Mm. I, my wife might disagree. We don't need strawberries <laughs> for Christmas. Mm. We don't need French beans mm. all year round. We don't need avocados mm. all year round. And I know mm. I'm going back to a day when we had Swedes and turnips and I hate mm. parsnips. But, you know, times of year, the mm. seasonal produce. Let's mm. have seasonal products. And yeah. let's challenge them to yeah. go to produce. We'll show you what we've got. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and there's a lot of places that we currently buy food from, a third of which are now known to be water-stressed as globally. So they won't necessarily be able to fry us with that food, so we need to build resilience. Lindsay, do you want to say Yeah, something? I thought the beginning of COVID mm. really showed how inflexible mm. our food systems were. Yeah. You know, we mm. had these small suppliers delivering mm. food to restaurants mm. and things like that, and when the restaurants closed down, there was nowhere for them to go, and the supermarkets mm. were mm. just not flexible enough to mm. take those good mm. ingredients and get them on the shelves. So mm. there's a huge amount of yeah. food waste through yeah. a lack of flexibility. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that happens. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> No. Yeah. 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 Okay. Did you want yeah. to come back, Roger? Just, and just very we, quickly. Uh, if anybody yeah. has any other questions, do do put your hand up. Very mm. quickly. Sorry. Mm. Just. I also work with the OTB, which is Organic Trade Board, which also looks at consumer. Which is hosting this session, actually. Yeah. <laughs> ah, there, well, there you are. There you go. So there we go. Very. Uh, so yeah. So uh, and they've been working quite. Hard quite closely with retailers and they find them very difficult I'm not saying they don't but but there is a, a recognition that cons organic consumers are actually quite a valuable consumer to have because they do mm. tend to spend more in store regardless whether it's organic or not they just tend to spend a bit more right. so they are quite keen to encourage organic mm. consumers into stores and so mm. some retailers are embracing organic to a greater extent than others so Sainsbury's are very engaged organic September which is currently going on at the moment, which is part of this piece, which is mm. why we're here today, uh, which OTV are doing. Or, uh, Sainsbury's have really embraced that, and they are actually starting to look at it at a more strategic level. And they have, they, they originally mm. uh, were very focused in the dairy sector, which is a big part of the organic mm. uh, market. Um, but the, once they had a success with that, they then, then went back into the business and said, look, guys, if we really want to make this work, what we've got to do is get it all joined up because it's no good going in there and buying organic milk if you then can't buy anything else organic mm. in the store. So they are, they are mm. starting to get mm. sorted, some to a greater extent than others, um, but all, even Aldi's, Lidl's, you know, the, 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 the discounters as we class them, also still uh, sell organic products. Um, so there is a recognition there, but as we've said, and, and, and as Jerry said, and as Lindsay said, the, what COVID's done is move people away again. Mm. We saw it in the financial crisis that 80% of organic food was sold through the major multiples, as we call them. Uh, but once the financial crisis came, a lot of the retailers removed organic and other high value ranges, and the organic shoppers went online. And we're seeing that. And that is eroding. So now major multiples have got about 67% of the market. And that is continually declining. And it will be interesting to see the consequence of COVID mm. when we look at this in the next few years. Again, I think the amount of organic food that's actually been sold through the major retailers yeah. it will decline. And mm. because people mm. will be looking, as was the case with Dal Dalesford, mm. we're looking for specialist yeah. organic producers that you can trust. You go and see them, you know mm. about them, mm. you can understand. And we them. need more of those available yeah. for all of the population, just not in those places. I had yeah. a question mm. here. Thank you. Um, mm. Just very quickly, it's mm. so much so why hasn't change happened sooner on organic was the question why haven't we got more we've got a very small amount of land under organic compared to many other countries in europe so it hasn't grown as it as it should have done but the market's grown we're importing a lot of organic food so uh, yeah question to anybody want to ask a why 
I feel a bit of a failure because I've been campaigning for organic for 30 years. So I feel responsible for part well, it, of it. It's actually a mm. very, very yeah. good question. Richard. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so 25 years ago, the Soil Association, for instance, I believe had 27,000 members of their organisation. Mm. How many members have you got today, oh, Richard? Membership or, yeah, because farmers and licensees are different. Yeah, we're 100,000 membership. Mem membership. Oh. Yeah, so, so has it gone up yeah. by a fourfold yeah, in 25 probably, years? Well, that's really good news because... But licensees, farmers, yeah. different. Yeah. 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 And everybody got the point, didn't they, about organic yeah. being the only real audited style of yeah. food that you can buy. Yeah. You know, I have a huge problem with free range. Yeah. It says free range. You can open as many doors as you like if the chicken doesn't want to go outside because he's got to <laughs> climb over 507 of his friends. It isn't very free range. <laughs> um, organic is the only one where we are audited. It's a very stressful three days yeah. for me. Yeah. when they come and do the audit mm. and all your ducks have to be in a row and the whole thing has to be correctly done. Sorry, your question was about membership. Why, why hasn't it, so it grown? Yeah. So why haven't we changed the world? Mm. Because subsidies have been paid in the wrong direction mm. to farmers to be encouraged to mm. be more organic, if you like, or environmentally friendly. It hasn't been the trend. Mm. 20 years ago, when I, you know, mm. I'm very passionate about my organic livestock production, People would come to Dalesford to, um, to sort of justify to themselves that they are right in their mocking and ridiculing of this weird style of agriculture. Mm. Today it's different. They all want information, they all want that energy. And I think we've never been in a better place now than to encourage people to farm, if not organically, but much more environmentally friendly. And, it's, and, it, and the main reason, of course, is that Simple education, you the consumer. What are you? What are you buying? You know, you're soon gonna, you're going to put that bottom end out of business if you choose to eat less meat, but buy better quality. You know, with a with a, with a beautiful story behind it. I would. And make it I would add oh, quickly because we need to go go mm. to the next question. Yeah. I was just going to say one of the other issues we have is as farmers, we're being pressurised by the people who sell us stuff. Mm. Why don't you go organic? Mm. Well, actually, agronomists don't want the, you to because we don't buy from them. The pressure is on from a lot of places for investment interest, to sell you chemicals, interest, et cetera, Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one of the pressures. I mm. think, I personally, mm. I feel the organic movement has been a little bit complacent. It mm. went really well for 20 yeah, years. I, we I were in a really that, good yeah. place. And suddenly yeah. it got a little bit easy. Mm. And we just carried on doing it. I was an organic farmer. And mm. pff, really, I wasn't chasing markets. I mm. wasn't doing the market. I wasn't doing anything other than just producing a product. I moved from producing a commodity product mm. to effectively almost mm. still producing a commodity product in my mind. And I wasn't open enough about it. Yeah. Mm. So. I think if you can all, if you ever meet your MP, encourage them to encourage the government to support organic, because I, I don't think this government is particularly yeah. supportive of organic yeah. compared to yeah. even the one in the 90s when I was working. We had an organic action plan, um, but that faded as soon as that government left. I'm going to move just, on because we've got uh, another question there. No, you can try and take yeah. later. Yeah. Can I just ask mm. about advantages, mm. disadvantages of corn-fed uh, and grass-fed? Advantages and disadvantages of corn-fed or grass-fed? What's the, what's the difference? What's the benefit? Yeah, yeah, and for the animal and um, farmer. Grass fed, grass. absolutely, massively more yeah. healthy, much more um, mm. products in it. it it's um, omega threes, omega nines. You look at the balance of those things. Corn fed just means mm. grass fed in itself. Pa Roger's mm. pasture for, on, on board pasture for life, yeah, I believe. Right, so yeah. pasture for life meat is brilliant because that is pasture, pasture. all the time, mm. all its life. Corn mm. fed means it's been given grain at some time in its life. Um, with pasture for life, never in its life. Organic, mm. it, you can be organic and pasture for life, but a lot of organic farmers will use a small amount of grain to finish off the cattle. Chickens and pigs have to have grain. We can't go to 100%. We've tried, we've, mm. took, we, you we know, we've worked on that project. We can't get there. <laughs> but we can get closer and closer. So pasture-fed and grass-based. But terminology is important mm. because an animal that's been out eating mm. grass is by, by legal definition mm. pasture based, but the mm. PFLA standard is never having anything but grass. Yeah, so. the Pasture Fed Livestock Association. If you could support them, it's a growing mark for, for uh, livestock farmers, really important. Um, mm. Ruminants, else want to ruminants so, basically evolved millions of years mm. ago, just like we did, to walk around the face of the planet and eat poor quality and high quality natural proteins in the form of mm. forage. Mm. We, as modern day farmers are bred animals mm. that need more than that mm. to grow uh, and perform and get themselves into a prime condition. Um, one of the things that I've done over 16 years is create a sheep flock of nearly 5,000 ewes 
that perform in the top 1% of sheep flocks in the United Kingdom as far as numbers go, uh, you know, in production, but 10,000 lambs produced from forage is hugely satisfying. And that's a ruminant stomach doing well from a forage-based diet. It has huge benefits. I met a lady once years ago, rocket scientist type woman, Vandana Shiva, you may have even heard of her. She was one of Prince Charles's great sort of inspirations. And she came to Dalesford and she said to me, you know, Richard, if we were to sit in a small room and be locked in and fed vindaloo curry for a week, we'd be adding to the noxious gases around the world. <laughs> and it's the same with a cow. And I read a piece, I think it was on the Soar Association website. He said, it's not, it's not the cow, it's the how. It's not the cow, it's, it's the how. The That's cow. a good and line. And I like yeah, that. Yeah. That was it's quite a good, a good one. Yeah. Yeah, that was it's not the cow, yeah. it's the... It's how. Uh, yeah. It's not the, the cow, it's the how. Yeah. Do try and support those farmers that are doing, doing yeah. it well. It's, 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 just mm. to pick on Richard's point, mm. the cows... The, the thing about mm. them, they're basically very low input, low output creatures. That's how they evolve. So you take low, low, low raid um, mm. forage, you stick it into a 50 kilo drum inside them, and they have bacteria in there mm. that breaks that down and, and mm. turns it into protein. And that's how they survive. And what we've done is try to take this low, low input, low output animal and turn it into a Formula One. Yeah. And, and, with with and, rocket and, fuel. And that's, yeah. and that's a problem. Mm. And mm. It, often, if you go into the, certainly mm. some of these intensive arms and you and you look at the cows even when they're lying down you can see them breathing really quickly because their physiology is going so fast because they're being pushed so hard so going back to Richard's point about being pushed and that's why they only live two and a half five years so then you get infertility in the cow you upset her reproductive cycle you All can't get her back into calf you can't go through patrician you're not entering another lactate. In a grass-fed system, you don't. There's no opportunity for that. A, a, you're working. You're I'm going to stop you. you start, I know you could talk for hours Sorry. about these things. No, you're so rude. Last question, and if you could think also what you would suggest to the audience to do, any things they could do, and I think as citizens, not just as consumers, yep. as a final comment. What, what's your question? Um, mm. Okay, agricultural colleges, are there courses, are they being taught um, organic and agroecological? There's, there's a shaking head in the background, so I think that's <laughs> answering the question. I know that, <laughs> that R mm. RAU, which is, um, I still call Sir Ancestor College, but it's Royal Agriculture agricultural University yeah. at Sir Ancestor, has, um, um, Nikki Cannon mm. is one of the, the professors there and she's mm. an organic support, so there is organic work mm. being done. Regen is now being talked about because it's this new concept and yes. this new idea. So it's the buzzword but at the actually moment. Actually, specifically it? trained mm. to do that? No, I'm not aware of anything specific. Yeah. No. It's a big gap. Yeah. I would, I would no, agree. Absolutely, with you. It's a big gap. Gap. As a researcher, you, you might agree. Yeah. Uh, I absolutely yeah. agree. Yeah. But I would also add that the uh, SIUC, the Scottish uh, Rural yeah. University College, mm. uh, they also have a masters on organic farming. Oh yeah. right. That's yeah. good to know. As, do, know. as do Harbour Adams. Okay, so there is organic so, so There courses. are some yeah. things, but even in the, well, mm. it's an agroecological mm. one rather than the SIUC, which is organic. Mm. Yes. The uh, Harper do a, uh, an mm. agroecology MSC, um, mm. but, but even they, within mm. that, they don't mm. talk a great deal about yeah. organic. I mean, it'd be great if every um, entrant into an agricultural college was taught whole farm approaches, yes. the whole system approach of, of farming and how they all link together and how to build fertility naturally. That, that would be an amazing start, so every, everybody was knowing that. Do you have any tips for the audience before we finish? I think I've probably, I've probably run out of time, so one, one tip. Um, eat, eat less mm. meat, eat better quality, understand where it comes from. Okay. Get to know where it comes oh, from. Frederick, yeah, absolutely. Get to know where it comes from. Mm. Talk to the farm. Go to farm shops. Mm. Like here, but there's others. Mm. <laughs> there are other exists. Mm. I'm sorry, but... <laughs> <laughs> are there? Yeah, yeah there are. Okay. Get to know where, you, where your supply yeah. chain comes from. And don't worry whether it's not a perfect-looking carrot mm. or potato because it will taste exactly the same as the one that's made to look perfect. Yeah. Like. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I've got a few too. I mean, I would say not just visit farm mm. shops, but go visit a farm. Go and see... The plants growing, the animals mm. thriving in those fields. Mm. And if you've got children, take your children. Um, we know from some research that children who have visited a farm, even if it's just for a weekend holiday or something like that, they make better informed choices than any label on any product uh, as an adult. So Thank you. 
Great, yeah. very, very important, <laughs> building the next generation. Helpfully, but also aware. Yeah. And I, and I would, well, I would say, uh, first and foremost, grow, you some, grow some food yourself. Yeah. Uh, mm. Whatever you've got, whether you just, it's just containers mm. or your garden or whatever, but, but grow some food. Mm. Because I think, and it's certainly in terms mm. of the new gen next generation, just the process of growing food, mm. you get a much greater understanding mm. of it and understanding mm. the value of it. And I think mm. that's one of the things that we... We talked about price and all the rest of it, but mm -hmm. I think there's a, there's a real lack of understanding of the value and the effort it takes mm -hmm. to produce good food. Mm -hmm. So I think if you can do that, that would be mm -hmm. great. And I think certainly get children, grandchildren and other people involved mm -hmm. and to understand that. And the final thing, I think, which none of us have said so far, is buy some organic food. Well, you have so. buy, buy organic food. <laughs> Assuming we're here, so we know well. Buy we know a bit about more, that. everyone yeah. else. But, but also buy fresh. Bit, yeah. Buy fresh, fresh if you yeah. can, and, and cook fresh. Yeah. Because, in, in you know, it's possibly a system where the farmer is getting more from the pound that you're spending than a processed product. Farmers, on average, get 9% of the gross value added of the agri-food system. So less than 10, you know... £10, about £100, goes to the farmers in this country. And the rest goes on the marketing, on the advertising, on the label, you know, all the fancy packaging and the executive salaries and offshore shareholders and tax, whatever. So an awful lot of the money isn't reaching the farmers when it really should to allow them to change their system, to do more rotations in diversity, to explore going organic, or, you know, and to get the kind of advice, getting Jerry's advice, you know, I'm not sure it's not hugely expensive, but, you know, <laughs> the, the, it needs to have more money in the system for farmers to be able to do what they need to do to recognise the climate and nature emergency in what they're doing. And we all need them to do that because it's absolutely essential for our lives and, and the home we live in and our children's homes. So if you can, um, lobby your politicians as well, either local or, or national. I would say that I'm a campaigner. Um, we need you to act as citizens as well as consumers. So yeah. if you can, please do get involved in any campaigns you hear about. There's actually an organization called Better Food Traders, which we founded a few years ago, which is about the bit in the middle, the traders, trying to get traders who recognize really good farming and are willing to trade it through to the customer in a much shorter chain and taking less out of the system, less money. So the farmers, like one in, in I um, buy from in North London, the farmer gets 50%, not 10% or less than 10%. So the farmer can then carry on being organic and carry on investing in their system. And uh, so all those things are really important. Mm. I hope you found this useful. Um, and if you've got any questions, I'm sure the panellists will be uh, happy to chat afterwards um, if they're not rushing off. But can I ask you to give, um, oh, and also buy my book and the other book over there. <laughs> little plug for my book, which talks a lot about organic farming and different types of farming as well. So it might be interesting for you. Um, but if you could give a, a round of applause for our panellists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming.